Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Our first story we'll be reading today. My Karen neighbor feels entitled to camp on my land. After that, am I the jerk for calling my brother a sore, slow loser? And after that, won't approve my purchases? Okay, I can work with that. Now for every thumbs up this video gets, one Karen does not get to camp on someone else's land. I can as long as I don't get caught. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. My Karen neighbor feels entitled to camp on my land. I own 16 acres of woodland behind my house and it's very clearly my property as there are signs up stating that it is private property. I'm generally good with people walking through it, taking their dog for a walk, or hiking, or even local kids playing there as it's a safe place and beautiful. And so long as they don't cause any damage or mess with the trees, I see no reason to get upset over this. An issue came up, however, tonight when I was on a walk and I saw a fire through the trees. I admit I panicked, thinking a dog walker had been out and tossed a cigarette or some local teens were setting fires for fun. I rushed out to check on it and tried to put out the fire and found one of my neighbors camping with her boyfriend and friends. It was a group of five people in their mid-twenties and they had a roaring campfire going. They got startled by me rushing up to them and asked me what the heck I was doing. I asked them the same question back and told them they couldn't camp here and they had not asked permission to do so. This led to some laughter and protests saying that they were doing no harm and to lighten up. I told them to put the fire out and get off my land. I didn't want to risk a campfire there as it could easily get out of hand especially when the group manning it were more than a little drunk. They ended up refusing, stating they weren't going anywhere and were not doing anything wrong, so I went home and called the police to get them off my property. They were made to leave and break up their camp. Am I the jerk for this? They probably thought it was okay, as I'm good with letting people use my land in general. I maybe could have handled it better, but I'd gotten a fright seeing the fire and how they responded. It really just got to me. Dog walking and camping are two very different things. They should have asked for permission, and anyone who says lighten up when confronted with trespassing deserves to have the police called on them. Their entitlement and attitude is to blame, not you, not the jerk. Not the jerk. They literally started a fire on your property. This is how bushfires start, drunk people. Is it not illegal to start fires on other people's land? OP, it very likely is. I don't know all the specifics of the law, but the police were not amused when I told them what was going on and were quick to come over. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or the neighbors? Please let us know. Why is it so hard for some people to just not trespass onto others' property? Am I the jerk for calling my brother a sore, slow loser? My wife, Irene, is very fit. She likes working out and has a proper exercise regime, etc. She believes that if she feels good, she looks good and she feels good working out, so who am I to stop her? My brother, Will, spent the latter half of last year going through a messy divorce and now needs a place to stay. Though my brother and I aren't very close, I figured he would only stay with us a couple of weeks until he got back on his feet. Will is a typical gym rat. He's always on a very strict diet, always working out and bragging about his gains. I've worked out with him a few times and he's a little obnoxious. He's always mad at you if you don't work at his pace and is always trying to correct your form. He's a pretty fit and muscular guy, but I don't like to exercise with him. Will has been pushing Irene to work out with him because, according to him, she won't be able to keep up with him. Irene mostly just shrugs him off with a laugh and tells him she would love to work out with him. Irene works out in the mornings, three times a week, and then does a run in the evening, but she's been busy this past week and hasn't been able to stick to her usual schedule. Will thinks that she's making excuses because she doesn't want to be embarrassed by him. Again, Irene just laughs him off. About two days ago, Irene and Will went on an early morning run. I didn't go with them, but the first thing I heard when Will entered the house was, The only reason I couldn't keep up with you, Irene, is because you were sweating too much. I found this extremely comical and kind of just laughed him off. Irene rolled her eyes and went to take a shower, so I thought that the conversation would end. However, Will just kept bringing up my wife's sweat. My wife went to work and he told her, Make sure you don't sweat through your clothes. Or when she called him in the middle of the day, he yelled, Tell the sweaty jerk I said hi. Of course, the jerk comment aggravated me 
and I told him to knock it off and stop acting like a kid. I thought that was the end of it, but he just kept going. By the end of the day, I was tired of his comments, but Irene seemed rather unfazed by him. When she served him food, he made a comment about her sweating into the food. At this point, I was at my wit's end, and I told him to stop acting like a sore, slow, referring to his running pace, loser, and eat his food. Will of course got angry and said the only reason he was going slower than usual was because he was distracted by my wife's unhygienic sweat. Irene looked a bit offended by this, and I told Will that I would kick him out if he made another comment like that. He's been super upset ever since. I jokingly told this story to a mutual friend, and they agreed with Will. Maybe I shouldn't be so harsh. Update. I didn't expect this amount of responses. Thank you all for the advice. I've decided to kick him out. He will be staying at a nearby hotel now. Not the jerk. Your mutual friend is a jerk too. When you're a guest, you act polite or get out. I can see why he's getting divorced if he thinks insulting the host is okay. OP. It rubbed me the wrong way when he insulted her when she was serving him. Like, why would you insult the person that made your food and is currently holding your food? We now know why the divorce happened and why it was messy. Well, not the jerk. Won't approve my purchases? Okay, I can work with that. I was a one-man IT shop at a small manufacturer. I had been there for years. I was actually the third employee ever hired and now the company was like 120 people. I was very frugal, but in smart ways. I got a lot done for a little money and always was looking out for the company. The owner recognized and respected this. Anyhow, we had gotten big enough where I didn't report to the owner anymore and I was assigned to report to an inexperienced accountant who got her degree from some sketchy online school. She was going to change the world. I used to be able to just buy anything I wanted because the owner knew whenever I asked for a company credit card that I had already done my homework and it would be good for the company. Well now, if anything was over $500, I had to go through this process with her to justify it. It wouldn't bug me, except that she had no real business savvy or common sense. It was just painful to me to try and explain the most obvious things to her and she would fight it just because of power tripping or something. Example, I was trying to justify having at least one computer loaded up and ready to go as a hot spare for when someone's broke. She balked at having $1,500 sitting on a shelf unused. I tried to explain that about once a month, someone's computer would break. All she could see was the $1,500 sitting unused most of the time. She couldn't understand the real cost of a broken computer, that the person could no longer do their job effectively, parts not getting ordered, jobs not getting expedited, emails not getting returned, me having to drop everything to react to this situation overnighting in parts. The true impact cost to the company was several hundreds of dollars every month. She couldn't see that having a spare would pay for itself in half a year or so. After a half an hour of fighting over this, I had an epiphany. I handed her requisition approval forms to her, told her she was right, and left. Any purchases under $500 didn't need any approvals at all. Now, nothing I ever bought was over $500. I didn't buy a spare computer, I bought three, as parts, and assembled them into computers. Servers? Network storage? Why justify to a bean counter who wouldn't understand anyway? Just buy more parts and assemble yourself. Dual monitors for everybody, bought one at a time. Explain to her that toilets typically have less than 20% usage, but when you need one... Fun fact, the typical car only spends 6% of its life being driven around. The other 94% of the time, it's just an expensive paperweight. And when her computer finally breaks, tell her, Sorry, we don't have a spare computer ready to go, so you'll have to wait while we fix this one. Should take about 5 to 10 days to get your computer working again. Shouldn't affect your productivity, right? I'm sure your supervisor will understand. Call me unprofessional? Okay, good luck finding another instructor. I realize today there are not enough stories on here about teachers and malicious compliance, so as a teacher of two decades, I decided it was time to write out mine. First and foremost, this is a story about a toxic workplace. This could happen in any business in the world. It just happened to occur in a school. Many, many moons ago, my school was having a massive shift in priorities and focus. We were a rural school, so new principal assigned to the building, pupils being redistricted, mass retirements, several people were being pushed out and run off by the incoming principal. A good number of people quit because of the toxic work environment, but I was not in a position to do so. 
At the time, I had a unique schedule. I taught mostly dual credit courses to juniors and seniors, but I also taught one course of students with SEN, SPED issues. The dual credit courses required a specific advanced degree as I was essentially teaching college credits in the high school. This detail will become essential later. At my school, we would be assigned support teachers to give additional help to students with SEN, SPED services. That support was not allowed to teach, but would typically share a classroom with the content teacher. I was usually unconcerned with who my assigned support was as I'm a laid back person who can work with just about anyone and I don't care about sharing a classroom. But there was one male support teacher who was not allowed in my room or near me in the hall, ever. For the sake of this story, we'll refer to him as Jerk. If ever a man knew how close he could get to harassment without crossing the line, it was him. Heck, sometimes he did cross the line. I made dozens of complaints, but nothing was ever done as I wasn't the target of his comments. The school year in question, Jerk was assigned to the most experienced teacher in the building. She was set to retire at the end of the year. Coupled with her no-nonsense attitude, the powers that be thought she could keep him in line. It took three weeks and she threatened to quit if Jerk was not moved out of her classroom. Fearful of losing another teacher at the start of a chaotic year, Jerk was assigned to me as my support teacher. I found out when he walked into my room, announced that we would be buddies now, and made a crude joke about how he could domesticate me. I immediately left the school sick and called my principal about the matter. He informed me in no uncertain terms that I could not refuse to work with someone just because that person made me uncomfortable. I reminded him of the previous complaints I had made. He snapped at me a bit, telling me he could not believe what an unprofessional child I was being. I was told to come up with a legitimate reason Jerk shouldn't be in my class or shut my mouth and make it work. After hanging up the phone, the malicious compliance began. You see, I did have a legitimate reason. Because of a health issue I have had for my entire life, and during extended periods of stress and anxiety can really hurt me. I even carry medicine with me to lower my heart rate just in case. Step one was to call my doctor, who brought me in the very next day after I explained what was going on. She took my blood pressure, faxed a medical letter to my school immediately, and signed me out of work for six weeks since I had six weeks of leave earned at this point. Step two was to literally stop doing anything. Usually when a teacher goes out, Lessons are pulled from other members of the school who teach at the same content. Unfortunately for them, I was the only person in my building teaching dual credit. A few phone calls by my principal to the surrounding schools taught him what I already knew. I was the only person teaching these courses out of 11 high schools. There were no lessons to be found. I'm not sure what they gave my students to do during that time, but it surely wasn't the correct work. Step three was to let two or three of the parents know what was going on. I never directly told them, but a friend of a cousin of a neighbor might have heard about my health issues and passed the information along. Here's the point in the story where you think I'm about to tell you I enjoyed my six weeks paid vacation and went back to work, right? Oh no, the malicious compliance continues. A week before I'm scheduled to return to work, my principal calls me up. Standard well wishes about my health are extended, after which he says that he hopes the weeks away from the building have cleared my mind and helped me realize how hysterical I was acting. He continued by telling me that regardless of my feelings, I would continue to have Jerk as a support teacher. I asked him if he was ready to lose a teacher over this, and he laughed and hung up. Knowing that this was probably going to happen, I already had a doctor's appointment set up for phase two. Because my health issue is explicitly and clearly covered by the ADA, my doctor issued me reasonable accommodation paperwork to give HR. Essentially, I was to be allowed to teach in the least stressful environment possible, as determined by myself and my supervisor, along with a doctor's note restricting me to teaching duties that could be performed at home because of the excessive stress currently in the building. I checked with a lawyer to make sure my contract was airtight. It was, and I delivered the paperwork to the head of HR, whose kid I taught. I also contacted my college supervisor, whose kid I taught, to inform her that as of Monday, I would have been absent for more than 20% of the seat time for my courses, thus rendering those credits invalid. Over the weeks, she had pieced together what was going on, despite the school refusing to communicate any information with her, and she was furious. She may have told other parents what was going on, which resulted in dozens of calls to the school within a few days. By Monday, my accommodations were approved, 
I was allowed to teach my classes virtually from my home to save the embarrassment of canceling dual credit courses and I wrote out the year at home before transferring districts at the end of the year. I never spoke to or saw Jerk again. Am I the jerk for refusing to add my ex-husband's name to the title of the bookshop I inherited from my father? Context. My ex-husband, Kevin, male 37, and I, female 35, got separated two years ago. We share custody of our two kids who are nine and five. My father owned a small bookstore in our hometown that I inherited recently. To be honest, the shop doesn't bring in a lot of money and I already have a stable income. Kevin found out and called for an urgent meeting. He came over to my place and said he wanted to talk about the bookshop. I said, what about it? And he told me that now that the shop is officially mine, then I should add his name on the title and split whatever profits I get 50-50. I was in shock. I told him he had to be joking, but he reminded me of when his dad passed and left him inheritance money that he ended up sharing with me. Therefore, I owe him half of my inheritance now. I didn't know what to say, but I mentioned to him that yes, he did share his inheritance with me, but that was while we were married. But now it's a different dynamic and we no longer share anything. He got upset and argued that I technically owe him regardless of whether we're still together or not and urged me to consider because the money will be going towards the kids anyway. We had a loud argument and I ended up saying that this will only happen in his dreams and telling him to wake up then told him to leave. He tried to lash back but I insisted that he leave. He had his mother call me saying that I lied, deceived and stole from her son in the past and I owe him. Not just that, but said that I should be rid of my pettiness and resentment towards Kevin and do the right thing for once. We fought on the phone and yesterday I was shocked when my nine-year-old son called me a thief out of nowhere. This escalated the fight because Kevin got the kids involved. I think that technically I do owe him because I can't deny that he shared his inheritance with me, but I think that now circumstances are different. Like when we used to share our salaries, but now I don't expect him to do the same anymore, obviously. Still, I might be the delusional one. So, am I the jerk? Edit. He has no background in law, but says he knows his rights, which should be enough. He's actually the type that spell law L-A-W. Not the jerk. Unless you threatened him to get half of his father's inheritance, doing 50-50 was his choice. You don't owe him anything. But you need to be careful with his behavior and what he says to your kids about this. You might want to talk to a lawyer to get proof of everything. The demands, the parental alienation. Yes, document everything. The calls, the threats, the flying monkeys, involving kids. OP, you owe him nothing. He chose to share his inheritance. That's it, period. Even if you were fully committed, still, you don't need to share yours. Given that you're separated, he's insane. He chose to share with her, and they were married at that time. That is not the situation now. OP, you don't owe him anything, and to involve your son is reprehensible. Not the jerk. Am I the jerk for not letting my nephew blow out my son's candles? I'm 21, male. My son turned four last Sunday. As usual, we had a small party at my mother's house, and we invited my brother, who's 30, male, his kids, who are eight, six, and five, and my sister, who's 27, her daughter, who's four, as well as some neighbors. Usually, when it's one of the kids' birthdays, all of them blow out the candles because that's how mom used to do it with us. Yet, ever since my kiddo turned two, he has refused to do so. Last year, when his cousins had to blow out theirs, he didn't participate, and when his birthday came, he didn't want anyone to participate with him. But all of the other kids ended up throwing themselves at the cake and did it anyway. I kid you not, my son cried for the rest of the evening and refused to eat his cake. My sister talked to her daughter about how that wasn't right, but my brother said that my son was a little wimp and he had to learn how to share. We stopped talking for a month after that until my mother forced us to make amends. A week ago, I told them that their kids weren't allowed to blow out the candles with my son. My brother didn't like it, of course, and my sister-in-law said that she was going to explain it to her kids and that it was okay. Fast forward to the party. My girlfriend comes with our kiddo's cake. We gather around the table and we sing happy birthday to my boy. When he's about to blow out his candles, I notice that my nephew, who's six, is about to do it too, and I cover his mouth with my hand. My kid didn't notice, blows them out, and jumps straight to his mama's arms all happy. My nephew starts to cry and tells my brother that I didn't let him do it and it's not fair. My sister-in-law tries to explain to him something, 
but my brother comes right at me for not letting his kid have fun. I remind him that I told them my son was going to do it alone, but he says, that's not how we do it. And I told him, well, that's how I do it now. If you don't like it, you can leave. My mom is telling him that I'm joking, but my brother took his kids and leaves. My son is obviously confused, but ends up playing with some other kids and forgetting about it. My mom says that I'm the jerk for doing this and that my son has to understand that this is our way and is forcing me to apologize. My girlfriend and sister say that I'm right because it's my son's birthday after all and I don't know what to do. ETA People, I get it. We shouldn't be blowing out candles. I'll do better next time. That wasn't the question though. Not the jerk. Good job covering for your son. Your brother and sister-in-law are clearly in the wrong for not teaching their kids basic manners. The brother is in the wrong for calling OP's son names. Who calls a kid something like that? Notice the ages too. The brother never had to share his birthday candles when he was four because his only sibling was an infant. I bet he loves this tradition because he's the one who started it, blowing out his younger sibling's candles when he was four, five, and six, and they were infants or toddlers that couldn't compete. Am I the jerk for telling my brother to go ahead and sue my husband for breaking his hearing aid during a prank? Context. My brother, 23, is a college student with a hearing disability. My parents got him a $4,000 hearing aid to be able to hear properly. So last week, while my husband, who's 32, and I, who am 26, were visiting my parents, my husband hit my brother's hearing aid as a prank and it got damaged in the process. After looking for the hearing aid for hours, my husband handed it back to my brother while laughing in his face about how freaked out he looked. He didn't know how delicate this type of device is and ended up breaking it while hiding it. My brother had a breakdown and started yelling at my husband and threatening him with court if he doesn't pay up for a new hearing aid. My husband didn't think he was serious and laughed him off. I was mortified to say the least. I told my brother to do it. Sue my husband if he had to. My husband side-eyed me and said, All right, princess. Two days ago, my husband came home and was full-on panicking, saying my brother is going through with his threat and is suing. I shrugged and remained calm and collected. He started yelling at my reaction, then urged me to call my brother and tell him to back down, but I said no. He did this to himself and deserves no sympathy or advocating from me. He was shocked. He yelled that it was just a prank with no intentions of hurting anyone, then shamed me for not taking his side. Moreover, he said that my brother only felt confident in suing him after I encouraged him by telling him to go ahead and sue. We had an argument, then I went upstairs and stayed in my room. He must have called my parents because he later complained about them deciding to stay out of it and let my brother sue. He then complained about how this is going to affect us both since he doesn't have that kind of money to give to my brother. This morning he blew up at me, saying me and my family are a bunch of sad pathetic jerks who can't take a joke and are willing to easily drag others to court and ruin their relationship with them over a couple of grand. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. That's not a prank. Imagine taking someone's prosthetic leg or walking stick and hiding it. It's not funny. A prank would have been hiding his car keys or house keys, not something worth thousands that helps him here. I can't believe he didn't offer to cover the cost anyway. That's what the decent person would do. You are absolutely not the jerk and I hope that this situation doesn't get too messy for you. You want more details in my weekly status reports? Okay, here you go. Enjoy. Back in the early 2000s, I worked as a software engineer on a team of software engineers. What this meant was that I spent a lot of time writing code, fixing bugs, defects, glitches, etc. The company's software releases goes in cycles and regularly goes into a cycle of fixing bugs for weeks at a time. My boss does a weekly status report that he sends out to his boss and some of the other middle management. He writes a team summary and then includes all of our status reports that we send him by copying and pasting. When we're in one of those bug fixing cycles, my status report looked like week of month, year, worked on fixing bugs. Q first malicious compliance. Boss asked that I provide more details. Now my status reports looked like week of month, year, worked on fixing bugs, list of bug numbers, one, two, three, and four. Q second malicious compliance. Boss had a sit down meeting with me and talked about better details than just bugs even though that's all I and the rest of the team have been doing. We had a small argument on this where I told him that if I provide more details, no one's ever going to read it anyway. That didn't go over well with him. 
He basically told me that if it's related to the actual work, put it in the status report. My new status report looks like week of month, year, day one. Working on bug one, two, three, four. No clue. Went to break room for coffee. Ended up talking to John about bug one, two, three, four for 30 minutes. Then talked to John about the bug he was working on. Five, six, seven, eight for another 30 minutes. On the way back to my desk, bumped into Jane, who asked me for help about the bug she was working. Spent 20 minutes in the hallway talking to Jane. We were both clueless. Got bug 2345 assigned to me, but I'm still working on 1234. Both are high priority. Everything is high priority. Continued working on 1234. Went to lunch with Jack and Jill. We ended up discussing the bugs we were working on for over two hours. Got some ideas to pursue. Ideas didn't pan out. End of day. We'll resume tomorrow. Basically, I did this for each day of the week and then sent it to my boss. He promptly asked me to summarize my week. I said, worked on fixing bugs. He never asked me about status reports ever again. Grown men who act like 12 year olds. This customer last night, he wasn't even rude or anything. It was just the way he was acting. It was absolutely unbelievable. So I get apps and drink orders from a three top give them another five to 10 minutes and then pop over to ask if they want to put in entree orders. Guests three and two were fine. She got the salmon, well done. He got the scallops. Guest one, presumably guest two's husband, isn't sure what he wants yet. Guest two proceeded to read off every meat on the menu and asked me if we had any other red meat options besides fillets. No, we don't. The only other options we have besides fish would be the pork chop or a lamb loin both of which are very popular and very delicious. The whole time I'm describing either of these dishes, guest one is shaking his head. No, I don't like pork. No, I don't like lamb. You only have fillets. I don't like fillets. Guest two, the wife, proceeds to start reading every option on the menu and the whole time it's going like this. Guest two, rotisserie half chicken? Guest one, no, I don't like chicken. Lamb loin? No, I don't like lamb. Pork chop? Scallops? Salmon? No, I don't like pork. I don't like fish. No seafood. I don't like seafood. Barbecue chicken salad? Steak salad? No, no salad. I don't like that. He eventually ordered the meatball appetizer as his meal. The whole interaction probably took 10 minutes and I got set with two more tables during this. So I ended up upset by the end of it because this man has an inability to eat food like a normal human being. That's all. I wonder what this dude eats on a daily basis. I also wonder how his wife puts up with it. If I went on a first date with a guy and he pulled that crap, I would laugh, get up, and leave. How do you go out with someone who acts like a picky kid? That's when you assert yourself when you see the first table set and say, I'll give you the time to make your decision. I'll be back. Then go greet your next table, then return. If they try to stop you, go to the next table anyway. You have to control the situation as a professional. One person is not more important than all the rest. OP, you are absolutely correct. I should have removed myself from the situation and let them deal with it while I greeted my other tables. It was like watching a slow motion car wreck, honestly. The cheerleaders can break dress code because they're school uniforms? Guess I'm wearing mine. Way back in 2013, I was a sophomore in high school and there was a tradition that on Fridays, the cheerleaders, football players, without their pads of course, band members, and the other groups performing wore their uniforms to class. This wasn't a written tradition, and only the cheerleaders and dance team's uniforms broke dress code. Nobody really batted an eye to it. I wasn't a skirt person, but I liked dresses once in a while. As one can tell by my user, I grew up in Texas, and it's still significantly hot in August and September. So, one time while wearing a casual sundress in September, I was pulled out of class and reprimanded because the end of my dress was four inches from the knee when the dress code said no shorter than two. I pointed out the cheerleaders and dance team uniforms every Friday and how they reached mid-thigh at the longest, but was told that was okay because students can wear official school uniforms and was sent home to change. Clearly, somehow, someone had forgotten I was on the golf team. Immediately, my mind was turning to the next Friday. The school had recently upgraded the golf team uniforms the year prior and the girls' team uniforms consisted of a short-sleeved collared polo shirt and a skort. If you don't know what a skort is, it's essentially a skirt and short shorts combined. It looks like a skirt, but they essentially act like built-in bike shorts, and these were short. I'd argue shorter than the cheerleaders. 
So that next Friday, about three days later, to my parents' surprise, I was ready to go that morning in my golf uniform, as compared to taking a bag to keep the clothes in to change into after school. But I just said, Fridays, we can wear uniforms to class, and they accepted without question and took me to school. Well, by second period, I was sent to the office yet again, and the first thing the assistant principal asked me was why I would deliberately disobey her right after our last conversation and threatened in-school suspension. I'll never get anywhere in life by not listening, yada, yada, yada. When I finally had a chance to get a word in, I said, but this is my school golf uniform, and I pointed to our school's logo that was sewn into my polo shirt. You said students can wear official school uniforms to class. Why are the cheerleader uniforms okay and mine isn't? This isn't even a skirt. It's a skirt. It has pants. I still remember how upset she was. She stared me down for what seemed like a millennia. Then she snapped and told me to get out of her office and go sit in the lobby area. That I knew what she meant and she would be calling my parents about this blatant disrespect. So I waited and played on my iPod and chatted with a nice secretary trying to keep myself distracted because in reality I had really been trying not to cry. I had massive anxiety when it came to authority but I still had my naive sense of injustice and I didn't want to just let this go. After about 20 minutes, she popped her head out and in a very monotone voice told me I could go back to class and to let teachers know I had gotten permission from the front office to wear my uniform. Then she went back in and closed the door before I could even think to respond. I spent the rest of my day dealing with teachers questioning me about my outfit and one or two calling the front office to double check my claim that I had in fact gotten permission and went to practice after school as normal before being carpooled back home. My dad met me at the front door with a small smirk and I asked him what in the world happened because I knew he was the go-to contact for my school, so I knew she called him. He explained that when she called and tried to get him to come up to the school and get me and talked about punishments for my insubordination, he immediately began to argue with her and admitted he raised his voice quite a bit, asking why I wasn't allowed to wear my sport uniform that the school provided to me as a dress requirement at my golf practice and mentioned taking this all the way up to the school board and resolving this obvious favoritism. He then asked me not to do that again, but that he was proud of me and told me, I know I had told you never to start a fight, but to always fight back. I always thought physically, but you dang sure took the advice. Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.